Coming up on Theater Talk. You're kind of have a mean streak, your character. It seems when we do it in a run and do the whole play, I start to realize how sort of awful I am. I'm sure you, you knew that. I, mean, I secretly did know it. <laughs> <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. Dick, well, this, well, this is amazing. How are you? I'm absolutely fine. Very, very well. <laughs> what? This? This? No, no. Don't worry about that. I, I was beaten rather recently by some friends. <laughs> <laughs> From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Michael, I have seen the depths of humanity, and I know so much because I have seen An Evening at the Talk House. An Evening at the Talk House is a new play, a dystopian play, a chilling new play, by Wallace Shawn. It's at the Pershing Square Signature Theater. Wallace, welcome to Theater Talk. Your Thank debut you. performance here. Yes, it is. <laughs> don't be scared. It's not, that's not that painful. Don't worry. Don't worry. It stars uh, uh, an old friend of ours, terrific actor Matthew Broderick. Welcome back to Theater thank, Talk. Thank you. And directed by uh, Scott Elliott. Welcome all to. Um, Welcome back to, to you, Talk. Scott. Thanks, huh? Thanks. All right, uh, uh, Wallace. Can you tell us, without giving too much away, what the evening at the Talk House is about? Uh, well, a group of people who work in the theater, at, or who did work in the theater, <laughs> put on a play 10 years before our play. And are you lost yet? <laughs> <laughs> no, nope, uh, no, nope, I'm hanging on your every word. Uh, and uh, they have a reunion. Mm -hmm. And uh, the writer of the play uh, is sort of narrates the uh, beginning. And that's, that's Matthew. Matthew. It's a group of uh, several people who were associated with the play in different ways. The wardrobe supervisor and the composer and uh, the main actor. And uh, they get together and during the 10 years since the original play, uh, the country that they live in has changed and some of the people have risen up very high and now work in the television program. Uh, that would be Matthew's character and the actor who's played by Larry Pine. Mm, fun, and fun. Um, some of the people have declined <laughs> uh, since that play was put on. And, and then into the party comes Dick, played by Wally Shawn, who's described as once a famous dandy, but now a pitiful theatrical hanger on. Yes, it's sad. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's your part. Yes, my part is a guy who uh, has uh, probably, well, definitely sunk the lowest. Um, <laughs> let's say, without giving too much away, he's been physically hurt mm. before the play starts. And uh, so that's the, the situation but there are a lot of twists and turns in it. Now, Matthew, um, you've been in this business a long time. This play must resonate with you. I mean, you come up the ranks together with a lot of young actors, mm -hmm. and some of you go to the top and make it, and others fall by the wayside. Yeah. Is it tough to come back and see those people as in this play a reunion when, you know, you were someone who made it, and you see other friends who left the business, struggled, um, couldn't do it? Yeah, <laughs> sometimes. I mean, the... the uh, the, on the positive side, there's sort of always hope, you know. I mean, people do do uh, have. Everybody has highs and lows who stays stays in plays. So mm -hmm. the person you meet who's not doing well very often is doing better than you the next time you meet them. So uh, the wheel does turn. It really does. It, it can be a very competitive who's doing well, who's not thing being in the theater, and I I very much try to avoid those types of. Uh, Feelings. If one can avoid feelings, I don't know, but I, I try not to uh, think about. And in the theater, I've never heard of that before. No, it's it's it it. 
somebody once told me if you allow it into your life, envy of other actors, it will uh, strangle you. It'll be, it'll be all you think about. Oh, that's wonderful advice. Now, but what I love about you in this play, because you do give just a wonderful performance. Thank is you. You're kind of have a mean streak your character yeah. and unlike your very generous description now of your view of people in the theater who have not done as well as yourself well i'm making it up yes, yes <laughs> exactly because your character has this wonderful kind of disdain towards uh, others who have not made it like for instance poor dick, old wally Shaw. Old dick <laughs> that's quite quite wonderful and really adds to your to your yeah m maybe so i mean it seems when we do it in in a, in a run and do the whole play, I start to realize how sort of awful I am. <laughs> Didn't quite get that until we started doing the whole thing. I'm sure you, you knew that. Having... I secretly did know it. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it's a, a uh, challenging thing to ask actors to, to play uh, people who are not admirable. Oh, but those are the fun roles. I mean, the villain well, is always it's, the best role, isn't it? Well, but in this play, it isn't that fun. <laughs> uh, the, uh, and very few in this play are admirable. They're, they're, There's a couple. Yeah, they're, well, really uh, only one who is completely admirable. I mean, it's tough to ask an actor to play someone who is not very self-aware and <laughs> Sounds was, like a lot of actors I know. So <laughs> you know, you being, can trick being, Matthew into this. Uh, well, in a way, everyone has been slightly <laughs> tricked into it because <laughs> it, the depths of the unattractiveness of the characters is not obvious on the surface. <laughs> and I think Scott has been presented with a challenge because he is a lover of human beings and 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 fond of the characters and yet he's been presented with these characters who who in a way are are horrible things are being shown about them yes yeah, scott what did, attracted you to this play <laughs> <laughs> well you know it's an amazing play you know just as a play and uh so that's number one also i have a long-term relationship with wally we've worked together many many times and are good friends i have compassion for the people in the play you know, and I've, and even though they're doing things that are, or, or their feelings are all screwed up because of, you know, the world that they live in and the world that they come from, mm, I always try to figure out a way to love them, you know, because that, I think that's the only way you can really get to the depth of the humanity of the characters in, in as much as like casting somebody as, as lovable as Matthew in that character. But very true, and that's true so piece perfect. of You know what I mean? Yeah. And so it gives the whole thing some wonderful complexity and, and that's what I really enjoy doing. I mean, I do enjoy the sort of darker, I mean, I think I'm known for that in some sick way as the person that does dark In their things. defense, <laughs> the characters are in a, a very tough uh, spot. Yeah, the world I mean, they, is bad. They may behave badly, but they're, uh, the way the world is presented Oh, no, they're products is, of uh, the world. They're trying to pilot a uh, pretty impossible. And we can say that it's a world where the, there's not much theater left anymore. There isn't, and can you imagine, None, like, it's really. how depressing that would be for those of us who are addicted to the theater. All of our lives right here would change so much if there was no more. And blast them out. Do you have contempt for the theater now? We're theater people to some extent. No, no. 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 I mean, the, the, the play is not really about theater. I mean, it's set in a theatrical milieu. None of the people in the play are still working in theater because they're really theater really has completely died. Mm -hmm. I mean, the play isn't about theater, but to the extent that it uh, is, there is, uh, theater was part of a better time. But when the play starts out, I, I think this could be now. Sure. And then when you describe a little more, well, then you realize it's not quite now. However, I want to say this play premiered in London in, in 2015. Uh, when Donald Trump was not a, a glint in our eyes. This is a pre-Make America Great Again play. You were so prescient. What set you about writing this play? I mean, because now we look at it and a lot of the stuff you're predicting could happen in a couple of months. He's going pretty fast. It is weird to read the news and yeah. watch the play. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what well, put you on? Yeah. yeah, I mean, the... Uh, well, I mean, to be... I can't talk about the play myself without being pretentious. 
Well, please, so please I, go ahead. I, Give it a uh, shot. <laughs> I do think that uh, writers, and it's a metaphor I don't really like, but it's inevitable. A play or many artistic efforts are a play is like a dream, and uh, somebody living today has put together different pieces of uh, the world in a strange, irrational, or poetic way, and they come up with something that is not catching what happens that very day, but the, possibly some of the deeper elements at work. And so you end up sometimes predicting. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, it is a very appropriate play for, for the moment of uh, Trump's uh, ascendancy. But the obviously Trump didn't come from <laughs> nowhere. I no. mean, uh, so, you know, I wrote the play, uh, you know, it was a few years ago. It was blowing in the wind. But these things were blowing in the wind. When did the play cross your path? Was, was Trump on the ascendancy when you first read it? Was there? No, actually, I read it when they first did it because I ran into Wally at uh, Italy and he said, I want to send you a play. I knew, we've, we've worked together, I knew, I knew him. And he sent it to me, but I, it was, uh, would have been a very difficult time to go to England and all that, but I, I almost did it back then. And oh, you it, were going to go to do it at the National Theater where it started? Yes. Then it, um, I, that wasn't possible, but then it happened here, and uh, so it came back. Hmm. In a different role. A diff he would have played my part. Yeah. You were going to play the failure, the yes. beaten down well, failure. Well, that would have been very me, He saw me at the market and said, I've got a, I got a well, part now, wait. <laughs> now, now, Wally, I do want to show, I, I want to show up here a picture of you in the play in England. Can we have this? Now, here you are playing Dick oh. in the 2015 England play. And I, I noticed you're wearing this, this very fetching toupee and you have a little mustache. Yeah, Walter's kind of a Walter Slaythek mustache. But he, now in this version, you do, you do not have your toupee. You do not have your mustache. Is, is there any reason for this change, Scott, in his look? You know, I wanted it everybody. Like John Wayne Gacy in that. But one. I sort of wanted everybody to look like themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Wally is like an iconic, you know, I may say, you He's know, indeed. person. And you know, I didn't want to mask who he was. You know, there's this pre-show thing that you uh, you experienced, and yes. and everybody's sort of out and about and milling. And I wanted everybody to sort of feel like. Um, you know, when they looked at Matthew Broderick, they saw Matthew Broderick, and then when they saw, looked at Wally, and they saw Wally. So, you know, so everybody felt right. all of one. I didn't want to present characters. Hmm. I wanted to present the people and the parts just, you know. This reunion, we're ushered into this wonderful space that's like a very chic, small club, and uh, we come in and there's waitresses, but they're really, you know, Jill Eikenberry serving <laughs> us what you, what you could describe as delicious and seriously sized snacks at the talk house. And, and there we delicious are. Delicious and generously Just sized snacks. snacks. <laughs> Some of them pleasantly sauteed, others delightfully freezing cold. That's how I describe them. One last thing I want to say, Wally, in your, in your dystopian world, that you have the people who've made it, made it in the theater, they've gone on to do insipid television shows that, you know, the big one being Tony and Company. Is that your show? Tony and Company. Yeah, yeah. Tony and Company. But then the ones who, who haven't done so well are now working as uh, government-employed murderers. It foresees a, an economy that's coming that if you don't make it, yeah, what are you going to do for a living? Yeah, the, the jobs have gotten pretty... Pretty bad. Well, Your pretentious thoughts? Like joining the army, I guess. Well, it's true, though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in other Happens. words, the army, we have an army of uh, people who could not get uh, work. Yeah. And uh, they're going to uh, foreign countries and killing people, or possibly sitting in some strange room in Nevada firing. Uh, drones, these are people who, in many cases, are driven to do that because of economic desperation. Or they won't even be working for the Army, they'll be working for Halliburton or some mm -hmm. thing that's even bigger than the government that we know nothing about that is accountable to no one. So you go to these serious notes that are very stunning. Yes, ultimately, uh, 
rightly or wrongly, it's a serious play. Yeah. But I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to give away. You know, too much. Yeah. For people for whom something heavy is absolutely anathema, probably wouldn't be pleased they would have gone to it. But well, they can stay home and watch Tony and. <laughs> now, on well, with if, if you take it back to the theater, though, because I've covered this business a long time, and you guys have been in the theater a long time, and I'm curious to know what your opinion, Matthew, is of how things are now, because back in the 80s, we had the Andrew Lloyd Webber shows, the good Neil Simon plays, and that was it. But you've lived through a period mm -hmm. where we've had some of the, a, kind of a second golden age of Broadway. I mean, things like The Producers and Hairspray and now Hamilton. These shows are as popular as movies. So the theater is actually fairly robust now, would you say? It's a complicated question. I mean, the, um, when I started out, it was, you know, people were like, it's about to be gone. Yeah. This was 82 or something like that. And yeah. uh, half the theaters were actually empty. Yeah. And uh, I thought I was just joining into a, the very end of something, you know, in a way, which was not at all true. Um, you could say that though it's become very enormous commercial things and there's less and less space for uh, riskier theater. It seems like there's a lot of that too though to me, but I don't have any statistics or anything. But uh, compared to when I started, I would say the theater seems to be very crowded and it's nice to see that there's people I'm being too Pollyanna-ish, but... <laughs> well, well on, the, on the brink of the defunding of everything. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but there, I mean, there's a hunger for it. Yeah. I see people lined up to, to come, and sometimes to uh, smaller theaters too. You know, our theater or uh, is always busy, and, at, and all three theaters at that center, mm -hmm. or four, however many mm -hmm. there are. So uh, the demise of the theater has, you know, not happened yet. What's your sense of this? Well, with the hyper-commercialization of Broadway, it's made our, our life at the new group quite robust. Good. Because there are people, you know, out there who are still looking for the actual risky theater and the sort of serious fare. I mean, we don't do everything serious, but we look for, you know, we, we want to do things that aren't going to be produced on Broadway. We want to, you know, do the riskier fare. And, um, and really our, our, box office has, you know, I'm knocking wood, but I mean, I mean, with thanks to these great artists, but we've been doing very, very well. Um, and it's exciting. It's, it's quite interesting what's happening off Broadway. I mean, hopefully the new administration won't hurt us. I mean, I'm hoping not because I think people who fund us are more passionate about making sure that step these things happen, continue to happen. But yes. And re regional theater, I wonder, I don't, what I don't know anything about is, you know, my father made a living in uh, regional, in regional yeah. theater, yeah. which I have the impression is much smaller than it used to be. In the, well, the issue with regional place. theater now, it seems to me, is some of them, uh, uh, this Broadway engine, this Broadway mm. machine. Yeah. Uh, is good for the theater because it broadens the audience out. Mm -hmm. Can be bad for the theater because there is this desire on the part of so many people in regional theaters to get things to Broadway. And if you're only thinking about Broadway, you're not thinking of an evening at the talk house. Nobody, when you wrote this play, you thought, I want this to be at the Broadhurst Theater so I can gross a million dollars a week. But a lot of the theaters now are thinking we have to get to Broadway. We need that recognition. So they begin to pick shows that are not, let's say, challenging as an evening at the talk house. Right. I think that's the, the Faustian bargain that nonprofit theaters are making with the whole Broadway world now. But you know, it's interesting because we have to, you know, in, in programming risky work, which we often do, we all, you know, it's one of those things you always have to think about, like how are you gonna make it compelling for people to buy expensive tickets? Because yeah. we have to charge, you know, prices yeah. in order to survive, you know, so it is a tricky sort of thing. And it's, we're very fortunate to have, you know, actors like Matthew or Ed Harris or Jesse Eisenberg, who are really interested in doing work like this come to us. And that enables it to happen in yeah. a way and to not feel like you're looking at empty houses. Well, what was the theater that you fell in love with, the theater you started in? What was it like? I was fortunate to be, uh, 12, 13, and 14 years old, very formative time in New York. Uh, so when I was 12, I saw The Iceman Cometh with hmm. Jason Robards at the Circle in the Square. Uh, then pretty, when, pretty heavy for a 12-year-old, I gotta say. Well, it was, but that was <laughs> my, my taste. Yeah. 
And uh, <laughs> at twelve, that was your taste. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I read all of O'Neill's yeah. plays, and then I saw when I was thirteen, they did Long Day's Journey into Night, uh, uh, with Frederick March and Florence Eldridge and Robarts again, and and around that very same time. Uh, at what was then the Theatre de Lise, they did the chairs and the lesson of Ionesco, and they, and then at the Cherry Lane there was Endgame. I mean, these were the first time the, all these plays were being done for the first time. I mean, I, that was I think very important in how I've ended up sitting in this august chair that I'm sitting. <laughs> did you ever in. take a break and go to Hello Dolly? I. I, I'm dying to see the new Hello, Dolly, but I didn't see the old <laughs> Well, Wally takes breaks from Stars and Clueless. You have a whole acting career in which you do yes. very artistic things, and then you do? I've done a lot of uh, things that are entertaining, and apparently, I mean, my <laughs> biography is odd because in my mind, I'm the writer who kind of was watching Endgame and Long Day's Journey Tonight and ended up writing whatever I'm writing. But actually, I haven't been terribly well-liked in that role. And quite a few people have been amused by my antics as a, as a sort of B-list uh, <laughs> actor. <laughs> <laughs> being <laughs> amusing. So, <laughs> so it begins to sound like you're playing even at the talk house. <laughs> I mean, this is sort of a, an interesting aspect of my biography. And still, even in, you know, we're doing this play in the signature building where there are many different theaters. And when I come out from the play, it, I've been greeted by people who wanted to take my picture or get my autograph. They haven't seen my play. <laughs> they've been there, there for some people. other no, not reason. Even, no, they just come for the... And, they've, uh, and they bring your pictures from, like, you know, your past. I signed stuffed uh, Simba doll. Yes. No, yes. no, no, no. It's sort no. of interesting how they are, these autograph people now. Really? They hang out outside and they haven't seen the show. It's huge. Oh, no. Yeah. But, I mean, it's... No, interesting. Good luck with your show. Yeah, good luck with your show. <laughs> Can you sign but my it's Simba also, doll? Well, You're kidding. I think they sell it. That's how they make The money. Simba dolls in the... On, online. When, when they have five of them, that's a, a clue. Oh, yeah. my God. But, I mean, it is true that it's each time someone comes up and says, you know, oh, I'm, I'm walking out of my own way. <laughs> they come up to me and say, oh, I'm such a fan. And then they, they say, I, you know, your performance in such and such really was so great for my five-year-old. <laughs> uh, Can I take a selfie? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that sort of thing, the selfie craze. Are Weird. you finally over the Ferris Bueller thing, or do you continue to get that? Is that no, finally passed? No, no, I get that. I sign a lot of uh, Ferris mem memorabilia. I sign license plates that <laughs> say nervous on them, which I think is from the movie. I do not remember it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it still exists. Mm. Oh, that will forever. Bar. I hope you get election at least, because that's my favorite. No, I never sign election. We love election. Yeah, election was brilliant. That's our. Yeah. That's your best that thing. Like Next to uh, an evening at the Talk House, election is your best ever. Well, I do want to say, Rent My Dinner with Andre, the brilliant film that Wally created with Andre Gregory and Louis Mao, and it is so timely. And watch it again and again. Do you sign my dinner with Andre dolls? Yes, right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have figures. to say, I mean, it wasn't popular, but. Uh, Marie and Bruce, yes. starring Julianne Moore and Matthew, is, is uh, I find it a great film, but uh, it, uh, it's one of those mysterious films that, uh, you know, it, it uh, let's be frank, it didn't make it to the theaters. Hmm. It is available only... But now we can find it. Yeah. Yeah, that's... But, I mean, there are a lot of films the, that... Yeah, there are. Mm. Art, Wally, art. What can you do? <laughs> All right. Well, uh, uh, go to Evening at the Talk House, the Pershing Square Signature Theater, to see the play, not to stand outside the door. 
and get yes, autographs. Yes, it's serious. From now on, you should before you sign anything, you should make them show the ticket stub to prove yes. that, that they were yeah, there. Yeah, that's a good policy. That's what you should do. It, it's serious, but it has a, a wonderful, funny, effervescent, and dark performance by Matthew Vardrick. And, and, and Wally, Wally is Sean hilariously Dick, funny in the, it, actually. The, the pathetic. Awful is he, is very there are funny. a new odd couple. Yes. Directed by Scott Elliott. You guys, yeah. could you switch roles like they did uh, that old time in... I, uh, I've uh, just got my lines now. <laughs> <laughs> no switching. No switching. No switching. You have a lot of them. All right. Sure evening at the Talk House. Lines. Evening at the Talk House at the Persian Square is Signature Theater. Don't miss it. Thanks a lot, guys, for being our guests on Theater Talk. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. The film will be great. The horrible truth if I dare say this, is that, that although I had some fairly nice times, some pretty happy moments putting on my plays, if pressed to the wall, I would have to say that for me, the theater came to seem more and more like a rather a narrow corner, a rather distasteful little corner of the world in which to spend my life. And I came to feel that it was a corner that I wouldn't mind leaving in whose general decline I was not, in my heart of hearts, terribly saddened about. Because what was the fear when you thought about it? Really, what exactly was it? You'd have to say that it was utterly and irreducibly about a small group of humans uh, sitting and staring at another small group of humans. <laughs> Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Bowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you.